Good morning, it's Brian here. We're at Expert Dojo. This is the art of startup war. I have a phenomenal entrepreneur on for you here today. And we are going to talk about communication within companies. We're going to talk about how you can improve that. We're going to talk about employee retention. We're going to talk about all of the things that companies are really, really struggling with these days. Now, we saw this company lead and we saw Yumi as their founder, and we absolutely loved it immediately. Um, I believe on our first call, at least if I didn't say it to Yumi, I said it to Victoria, which is that we want to invest in these people. Um, and there was a few reasons why we really, really liked them. Uh, first of all, pedigree is everything. And you can see it. You can see it in people's eyes. You can tell the ones that will do whatever is necessary to build that unicorn, to build that great company that can scale to unlimited heights. And Yumi just had it. Number two, her team is absolutely phenomenal and off the charts. And she's going to go through that a little bit later on. Um, I loved the space that they were in. I loved how they were attacking the space. And I loved their plan and how they did it. So that's my reasons for having absolutely not a doubt in the world in putting money into your company. And I couldn't be glad or happier to have you in the Expert Dojo family. So Yumi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian, for the great introduction. Of course. No. So, okay. So now tell us a little bit about Lead. And I want you to explain a little bit about the company, but take us through the background of where it came from. What was the genesis of the idea? Yeah, sure. So um, as you introduced earlier, I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Lead. I have two other technical co-founders. And then the uh, for Lead, what we are doing is that we help company build brilliant teams by maximize the course team communication and the collaboration, starting with introduce coworkers to each other in Microsoft Teams and Slack. So how did we decide to um, build it was actually a personal story um, back in 2016. Mm -hmm. So back then I was a country manager, the first country manager for uh, May2 technology. So May2 is this consumer app that's like, you know, have their beauty plus, makeup plus. It's kind of like, um, you know, TikTok and uh, uh, Snapchat um, type very of- Very popular. Uh, yeah, very popular. So um, this company had a 4.5 billion IPO and also, uh, in Japan, our team, we were able to have like 20 million users. That's like one out of three women who are using our product. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. And then, you know, globally, it was like 800 million users. And then the company was viewed as a former unicorn. However, um, as a lot of interview, um, you know, on the internet said that people in the company quit every week. So they had, so the company had, as by the way, did many, do many companies, they had a, an employee retention problem. So you've got a company that is scaling massively quickly, but at the same time, they're leaving the most important resource they have, which is their employees that they desperately need to scale. And they're leaving those behind. Yes. Like my boss spent most of his time keeping hiring new hires because people keep leaving and that's really bad. And however, for our team, I was able to manage 100% employee retention. Amazing. It's not a big, thank you. It's not because that they never had the thought of leaving. Actually, I had to go personally talk to a lot of people a couple of times to make sure they stay. But what I did differently in the daily practice is that I make sure they are connect with just um, not everybody on the team, but also people that they do not directly work together, people mm -hmm. from different teams, such as teams in China, teams in India, time, teams in UK. So they can learn from each other and also find a sense of belonging, find the you know purpose of their job, how their job can impact others, and then the goal of the total company. So um, after that, um, I was inspired to, you know, pack this uh, practice um, that we did in May to, to be able to build into a software. So any companies can you know, plug and play and then be able to reduce turnover related to employee um, like relations and also lack of 
job opportunities. So really, it's quite amazing what you did. You, you, you physically went through a process of working out that if you deal with employees in a certain way by improving communication with other employees who are best positioned to be interacting with those employees, then people will generally stay longer, right? Yes. And, but that, and that's wonderful. What's really incredible is that you then codified it. You then said, ah, okay, if we know that if I put this person with this person and if I put that person with this person, if we know that that results in an increase of retention by 20% or 50% or 100% in some cases in teams, then why don't we create an algorithm and then why don't we build machine learning into that so that, that we can actually now automatically have this HR process which feels really wonderful from the employee's perspective because the employees are continually engaging with other employees, feeling like they're getting stronger, they're getting mentored, they're building friendships, they're building a better work environment. And from the employee's perspective, they know that those matches are also incredibly attuned to actually connecting the right employees that will make those other employees want to stay, for, want to stay longer. Exactly. And it's also about puts the best person at the best job. Because sometimes as a manager, you don't really know like the person have some potential in other type of jobs. It just, and then um, through those communication, you actually can rearrange the job, uh, what do you call that? You know, the tasks they're mm-hmm. actually working on. Yep. So yep. as a result, you are basically allocate the best task to the uh, best Um, person so you keep the best possible team amazing amazing so fantastic so you work this out so one thing is working this out which is brilliant in itself so we have an incredibly skilled person who's just come out of a unicorn which you probe out a thesis you then say right we now need to build the technology so one thing is coming up with this idea another thing is being able to make other people around you believe that this is a technology that can work. Talk to me about how you went through that process, both with your co-founders and then also with um, investors and other people to actually help this become a reality. Yeah, sure. So um, with my co-founders, so uh, let me talk a little bit more (laughs) How do I do this? Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. So with my co-founders, um, yeah, um, as we build this uh, software, we are trying to identify, um, you know, the business silos. And also we are trying to understand how we are able to make sure there's a um, customization, not just for the team, but also like personalized for individuals when they need to support. So mm-hmm. this will come to um, that we need a data scientist and also AI engineer that to be able to um, put this software, um, not just a normal algorithm, but you can learn from time. So uh, that's how I brought um, my co-founder Ayman um, into our team. So Ayman's specialty is um, he's an AI engineer and mm-hmm. also he's a data scientist. And before um, he joined Lead, he started three startups in the past. Uh, and, uh, and his specialty that related to our software is that he's very good at analyzing um, the data, the metadata from communication tools such as email. It's not like reading the email content. That's not what he was doing. He was doing the metadata to see where the email coming from, where it's going. Yeah. Yeah, and then, then um, I have another co-founder, Jay. The reason um, I brought him in is that he works in a large company in, um, and then, then he was um, engineer, but a little bit introverted. So mm-hmm. um, he personally had um, joined a company program that led him to meet more salespeople and marketing people in his company. Yeah. And then one day he found this um, person that worked in this um, sales team that, so, that was selling his product. So after a talk, he had a, a lot of inspiration about why the product managers always talk about the product and they need to be built in certain ways. So that gets 
give him a lot of a clarity of why he's um how he work with different people and then after that he become much more open to talk to different people in his team which impact his job and then um at this company uh Twidio, he was able to um uh, basically build this product from beta to GA and also uh, he has the experience to um, make sure this product that's not just for good for the US but also for the rest of the world. Right. So those experience was very important for lead as we build our software in Microsoft team and Slack, potentially we are able to reach a global audience and his work experience in building enterprise softwares that the emphasize on you know privacy and also um, data security and those things um, are really um, helpful for us to um, build our software that you know, have like GDPR compliance, not just from a privacy um, policy, but actually from a you know that daily practice. Fantastic. So you built, you found a great, you found great co-founders. You then managed to get, and it was great that Jay had already gone through the process in a manual way. And as long as he's like, oh, I get this. I've seen this. I can see how it works. And intuitively, it makes sense to everybody who engages in something that's the smarter you make the learning mechanisms, the, the more it helps the employees, the better the productivity of the company, the longer people stay. It's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's no downside to it. So, and I want to get to your traction in a minute because it's been very, very, very impressive. But before I do that, how did you manage to convince investors to put money into it? We came in, I won't say late, but we came in after the product had been built. You had some great proof points. I actually think we would have invested if you'd come to us six months earlier anyway. But talk to me about what that process was like, finding those investors, making them believe and kind of where that took you to? Yes, I think the early investor we got for um, our pre-seed was mainly the people who worked with me in May 2, and then they know how hard to have this um, uh, 5,000 uh, 5, K budget to be, and then use that marketing um, budget to reach 20 million users, which is one out of three women in Japan. They saw how I work daily with my team, so they just believed in me and in my um, co-founders. You bring up, let me stop you there for a second, because you bring up a really important point. You said they saw how you turned this tiny budget into one in three women in an entire country using a product. Yes. When it comes to growing a highly investor backable, scalable business, that is the only thing that matters, right? Is how do you manage to drive more users proportionately than anybody else is able to do with the same amount of money? You want to be able to raise money the same as other people raise money, but plenty of people raise money and waste it. And like 20 million waste is easy to waste 20 million as it is to waste 40, as it is to waste five. But the people that can take a tiny amount of money, whether it's half a million dollars, a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, and turn that into gold that pays back many times over, those people are the ones you go after. And I can and I think you've absolutely nailed it there. That's what would have been massively attractive from an investor perspective. Thank you. And then, then um after um you know my success in May too, there's a um you know Japanese TV such as um you know Nihon television and also NHK and then then there's a large um magazine talk about my work. Mm -hmm. And then um those angel investor who worked with me brought those things to um, you know Michael VC ISGS investment work, and they their LP one of their LPs the second largest HR consulting company in Japan, um, and then they feel that what the problem we're talking is actually quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Then I got in an interview with them, so I talked to them about my um, career path. I started, so I'm Japanese and Chinese. I uh -huh. um, started my first business when I was 18. I wow. told them that, you know, when I was 18, my mom was sick. So I had to drop out from college and then start my first three business in modeling 
agency and also real estate agency and translation agency. Then I sold the, the house worth four million US dollars back wow. in 2000, uh, 2008. Um, back then I was only 20, right? So that so th after that, I got back to Japan, I got my law degree. And while I was doing my law degree, I joined the HR consulting company, Hayes. And then later on, I um, worked with an um, advisory company that helped a VC fund to launch their first fund in Japan. Then I came to the US and then started to work with Meitu. So I talked to them about my um, history that I'm a natural. Are you, are you sure you're not like 60 years old? Because you've done, <laughs> you've done more than me. <laughs> I don't think that's okay. You've it's done a more than most people. It's ridiculous what you've done. And, and, and I love that you got this breadth of experience that you have all of these different places to draw from because otherwise the startup journey making decisions every single day like how do you do it if you don't have all of these experiences to pull from so this has to have really helped you with the journey so far exactly you know especially in asia it's not like um here in america that people respect women that much so uh, as a you know mixed race i've been through the horrible most horrible you know racism ever you could imagine wow. um yeah and my first jo a consulting job the ceo asked me to kneel down and serve the tea and Whoa. it was really bad and then the thing is that i always want to be a better self so i constantly find the mentors and the friends that could teach me i uh, despite i learned uh, law i um you know nerd accounting um and then, then got the certificate in accounting myself and then um you know it's constantly start study to reach out to people like who can tell me more right and then um so that's why when i was in um on japan when i first got my first job after graduation then um i wanted to um, you know, no more. So I met a mentor and the, he told me, you know, how about the technology and you can get more, if you speak Japanese, Chinese, English and no law, no accounting, no so many things that you are ambitious enough that you should come to the US, um, you know, to get involved with technology and stuff. So, so I think those um, small advice that you can get from the peers really can change someone's life if you open your heart to actually listen to and then do your own research to learn that's one thing i really like about our software it basically opens the um, possibility to uh, young individuals that they can learn so much from their peers that's a great point. And so many of us, we just go from day to day and we may even speak to amazing people, <clears throat> but we don't do it intentionally. Right? We don't do it intentionally to find out things that can actually make us better, stronger, faster, more efficient, happier, healthier. All of us have all of this information that we can share. And if we're guided to be able to share that through our organization, through our office space, we're not going to want to leave because we're benefiting so much by all of this incredible wisdom that we have around us. I think it's absolutely fantastic. So you got investors that you should never have got because you are who you are. You got a team and built it together that would have been impossible for most people to be able to pull together because you are who you are. And then you get to the stage where you say, OK, we've built this incredibly complicated software because it is. This is not simple. This is extremely hard to build. And it needs to be integrated into existing systems, which then have to be integrated into customer systems as well. So incredibly complicated system. You built it. You put it out. You put it to market. What was the experiences from the customers? Yes, so right now we have um, about 400 companies uh, download our software within seven months. Amazing. It was pure, thank you, it was pure organic. Um, and then I talked to a few companies that, so usually the thing is that they re, if they are the right type of customer, then uh, after using our software for um, two weeks, they will email me to ask, can I get an upgrade? Uh, and then, or like, 
does your software do X, Y, and Z? Then I will jump on a phone call with them to ask, you know, um, how what's your company's use case, and mm -hmm. then how many people are there, and then you know, I sometimes will ask, you know, where's the budget from. But sometimes it's obvious because they are from HR, um, learning and development department, and that's usually where the budget is coming from. And then um, just interview them and see, you know, how those things can fit into our roadmap and how we can prioritize to build the things out. Amazing. So, so again, so lesson that everybody listening has seen that either whether it's investors who are the, the majority of folks who listen to this podcast, and you're thinking, what should we do with that with your existing startups to help them? You got that first lesson from Yumi right at the start, which is that builds that really strong base of experience and knowledge and domain expertise. So when you're building the product, you make sure that that product is so incredibly robust and there's no holes underneath it. And then we've now got to the second piece, which is to make sure that as you're actually growing the product and you're starting to work with the customers, don't outsource this. Speak to the customers yourself. Somebody wants an upgrade, pick up the phone. Somebody needs a feature checked or needs to get feedback, pick up the phone. Somebody wants to know how the product works, pick up the phone. What you're looking at here and what you're listening to are the drops of success that come from an entrepreneur that is building a unicorn in the waiting. And it's because she's putting in the hard work along with her co-founders now so that she can guarantee the results in the future. It's just... It's everything. I know it must be absolutely exhausting, Yumi. I know we were we were speaking earlier on, and you spent the weekend going through IP contracts and legal contracts. What a glamorous lifestyle! Yeah, it's it's actually. Um, so the thing is that I always think I need to do better. I think maybe <laughs> I have this mentality. So after, since I raised our first uh, first seed round, what I thought is that. I did not have enough technique experience. So I actually went to a boot camp to learn coding. And then after that, I started to learn how to be a better PM. I've been reading books, I've been do doing online courses. And after that, um, when I first launched the first version product, you did not get the initial traction. So I interviewed about 3,000 people in wow. both the US and Japan. Um, you know, in the company and also, the, you know, the HR managers. And after that, I thought, you know, I probably should get a, a, a course that's just in HR so, and people analytics because I want to be good at, at the domain like myself, not just from my working experience. So I also took Wharton uh, exec, executive education and then go through the HR um, analytics and management. So. I think I, I really like to learn more and I also want to be the best that I can be to make sure that the, pe the people who invest uh, their money to our startups, uh, we can use it wisely. Very good. And then so talk to me about the investment strategy going forward. So we know great team has been built, a great product has been built. We've got phenomenal traction for a company that is so new with zero spend on marketing so far. Talk to me a little bit about the investment strategy. And then after that, we're going to go into your user growth strategy. Yes. So right now, um, we, after a few um, rounds of calculation, we think we are going to raise 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. And then out of that, about um, um, 800K are going to use for uh, R&D. And then there's uh, the rest, um, 20%, I'm oh, sorry. The rest is like 80% is gonna be on, on marketing and also user mm -hmm. acquisition. And then since we are going to build a remote team, so there's the general cost and management cost will be quite low. So that's pretty much um, how we are thinking about the uh, fundraising and why we need the 1.2. And also um, at the first two years, we are going to focus on inbound business. Mm -hmm. So basically means that we will have um, customer success, but not really have like a proactive outs like sales managers because those sales managers, they usually cost a lot of money. And also based on our price um, per customer, 
it's um, it's better to make the product more as a um, self-servable product and then have a minimum support. But as we grow the product value uh, and then the price per customer increase, then in a third year, fourth year, maybe we will start to consider, you know, hire actually salespeople. But it does not mean that during this first two years, we're not going to do the, you know, and then like spend upsell process. We're still going to do that, but it's sort of a customer success point of view. Yeah, and I think what people will read into this is that you're very fiscally responsible. Uh, you're very careful. You want to make sure that the product is the perfect product for the market. You want to make sure that it's deeply engageable. Like it's very interesting. If we look at Slack, and obviously Slack wasn't their first product, right? Some, some people might say it was a mistake, but it was a good mistake. Um, but if we look at how Slack developed, really all of the focus was on making sure that the Slack product was as robust and uh, functioned as well as it possibly could. And then once that happened, actually the focus didn't really need to be sales. The sales in many ways took care of themselves because they had the product such an intuitive, intuitive simple, and easy to understand way. So I, 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 I love that focus on making sure that actually rather than just forcing a product down people's throat, you actually start building viral marketing. Exactly. You, you have it, people are begging you for it. Exactly. So for example, Y Combinator's partners also talked about, you know, as an early startup, you should not spend a lot of money to buy users because that's cheating. You should build this product that's so good so the product will sell itself. I love that. Thank you. I love that because because that's right because really real beast entrepreneurs they don't want to cheat. We got plenty of time to do that in the future. They want to build incredible products that people just get behind straight away. And then how do you see the growth of the product working? So if we say okay, we got 7000 users today, and um, talk to me about how that growth will be aligned with the money that you raised for the 1.2 million dollars and and even going forward. Yes, sure. Thank you uh, for asking to bring this uh, question up. So um, right now we have more than 7,000 active monthly users. Mm -hmm. um, those are not just users that are actually active <laughs> monthly. Um, and then, then our goal for the beginning of next year is to um, get it to 50,000 um, users. You might think that's crazy, but actually we have a lot of large companies they could get a couple of hundreds and thousands more users to our software. The only thing we need to do is to be able to support that many users. That's one thing we are raising money for is to make sure our technology and, and our software have the enough capacity to um, let them to load more users in the software. Yeah. And second thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Please go on. Yeah, second thing is that we are going to um, turn on the switch to charge users, not just like make it free. Um, in a, uh, later this year or maybe beginning of next year, we are start to um, turn those qualified user companies into um, paying customers. So for that, we also need uh, to, um, you know, bring better user experience than it is now. I mean, right now it's actually quite good because the HR managers really like it, employees like it. The engagement rate is usually 70% to 90% wow. compared to, thank you, compared to the actual HR software such as, you know, a survey. After five times HR get angry, it's still 50%. So our initial start is starting from 70. So that's quite good. But definitely I think those funding are going to be heavily invested in um, you know, user re retention and also how do we expand into the company since you know, um, large companies such as Microsoft, um, they themselves also installed our software. Fantastic. And it's also so smart to go through Microsoft Teams as well because it, it's really, the, it's the, the bastion, it's the place where the larger companies have their users. So you could pick up a company that's got 20, 50, 70,000 users. And the wonderful thing is, where, where I think yours gets really interesting, is the more global companies get, the more it's needed. Yes. Like as long as, because you build context into the introductions. Yes. So me being able to speak to somebody in France 
who happens to be a project manager in France of a senior level, that I get the opportunity to interact with and understand how his project or her project management is done based on local culture and law and clients and everything else versus what I have here. This is a little bit like what you had spoken to about beforehand, about continually being educated on your employment journey. Exactly. So if we get to, okay, so we grow to 250,000 users next year, which, by the way, I don't believe is, is, is crazy or impossible or even hard. In my mind, you're already at 250,000 users. All we have to do is make sure that, that, that the platform is sufficiently robust, that it can make sure that those users get a phenomenal experience all the way through. And then when do you see us raising our next round? I think after um, raising, you mean after this 1.2 million mm -hmm. and then yeah. what's next? I think that's really um, easy to predict because right now, if we, our current user, if we turn on the, um, you know, payment, the revenue based on our, you know, paying tiers that could easily generate half a million already, right? But so if we are able to, triple, you know, and the multiple the users like we discussed earlier, then that will be easily after another year. So in 2022. Fantastic. So nothing but growth here. So now, just as we're coming towards the end of the podcast, I want you to speak to investors. So you're talking to people who are putting the $1.2 million in. And let's pretend that it's not just Donald Trump against Joe Biden. Let's just say it's Donald and Joe and Yumi. And Yumi is now speaking to all of the investors out there who are, build, who are looking to build unicorns. They're looking to build, and f sorry, they're looking to find the next great company that's going to break through. Speak to them and talk to them about why LEED is going to be that company and why you are so sure in everything that you're building here. Sure. So first, I think it's about our team. Uh, we have a great team with great experience that specialize in um, HR and the future of, future of work technologies. Mm -hmm. We spend the time to make a product that people want. And then we know where exactly to take this product to go, uh, to take the product to. Second is that our growth right now, even with those organic download that we already know there's massive needs in the companies. And then companies are email us to, to ask to pay for the product. Mm -hmm. So once we are able to have some investment, we are definitely able to be able to support those customers better. Third is that I think our barrier for p other people to entry is that we are going to um, first is about the pattern that we are going that we are finding at the moment. Second is that we will be able to have cross um, company benchmarks mm -hmm. and in the da data sets that in our software. That's not just to correct the existing data, but actually our software will generate the type of data sets that no other company has, yeah. that will be actually very hard for new players to get into our space. So, so, so really it's a data play in many ways. Yes. And then um, we are the first mover in Microsoft Teams to build this product and launch this product. And then, you know, f first um, player usually also get a lot of benefit as well. So as we have an experienced team, uh, not just the academic side, but also engineering side. So I think that pretty much fits into, you know, the, it fits into like companies like why you should invest. Absolutely. And on, yeah, and on top of that, uh, we're three founders coming from three different culture. There's a lot of a diversity into um, our business culture already. And they were very experienced in, um, you know, managing a team with diversity of culture, which is what companies, a lot of companies want. They want to have diversified team and they want to be able to um, make their team more efficient 
in productivity and the collaboration and the innovation. So um, that's pretty much why I think we are, um, our product is good, our team is good, and our space is good. You got it all. <laughs> and look, and I've worked with Jay, and Jay is a genius. Um, I've worked more with you, and I have to say, you know, whether it's the, some of the things you mentioned earlier on about what you've gone through to actually make it, because uh, there, there are there are layers of difficulty, right? The, the first layer is, if you're a woman in entrepreneurship, it's just so friggin' hard compared to just on a basic level, uh, on any level. If you have to deal with the racial angle as well, it becomes harder by a multiple of 10 times. But, you know, like my dad said, these things that push us down, they either break us or they turn us into the most incredible beings of our time. And I think everything you've gone through, both positive and negative, has actually turned you into a formidable opponent for anybody out there to ever have to worry about competing with. And it was my number one choice for investing in you. There's not a doubt in my mind that you're going to break through and you are going to build an absolutely phenomenally wealthy and successful company. And we're all going to benefit massively from it. And we're with you all the way. So for all investors out there and everybody looking to contact you so they can feel like me too, how can they contact you by email and then just the website as well so people can take a test drive? Yes, definitely. Are hmm? you asking me about my email address? Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's you me at uh, lead.app. Um, so lead, L-E-A-D dot H-E-P. Perfect. And that's you, the same for the website. Yes. Uh, website is www at lead dot app. Dot lead dot app. Okay. Beautiful. Yumi, thank you. Thanks for being a part of my journey. I'm so happy to be a part of your journey. We're going to do amazing things. And that's a wrap. Mm-hmm.